Good morning. Well, after a very full week of VBS, I know a lot of us took yesterday to, uh, to take a little rest, <laughs> but it was amazing. In just a few minutes, you guys are going to get to see a video um, of VBS highlights, but um, let's just stand to our feet. This past week, I can't wait for you guys to see some of the, the highlights, but really just the fact that we got to collaborate with another church and just see the bigger body of Christ at work was a huge blessing. And um, I know I'm not the only one that, that has this thought, but it is kind of lonely up here without uh, giant monumental sets. Um, that was super fun to get to, <laughs> to, get to be uh, dancing and singing and playing in. So we definitely miss it. The church feels a little, little bit like, oh no, what happened to all the color? Um, but we know that Ultimately, we got to serve, I think, almost 85 kids last week. And so um, thank you guys all for, for everything that you did, for your prayers. Um, if you couldn't be here, um, it was a really awesome week. And we'll show you that video here in a few minutes. But let's just open. Um, let's just praise, praise his name and worship together.
Good morning. Good morning. What an amazing thing it is, right? That, that God loves us so, so much that he came to save the world. And that is the greatest story we'll ever hear, right? That's why we come together. That's why we share life. That's why we, we worship. That's why we praise. And man, his love for us is amazing, isn't it? I was thinking about that this week as kind of Shannon and I were traveling with some friends and we went to, to Florida and it rained like every day, which, you know, is typical Florida, right? But it was just such an amazing time because we were with our, our family from Maine who, you know, we served with up there and we just got to pray and got to worship and just got to, to talk about what God was doing in each of our lives in completely different corners of the world. And through all of that, like we could just see God's beauty. And I was just like, Man, this is exactly what I needed. And God knew that. God knew that I didn't need sunshine and beaches and, and big old fish. So, you know, even though it does make me a little sad. Um, but I definitely needed to be encouraged and rejuvenated. And, and it was just awesome. It was just so great. So that's our desire here at National Hills, right? We want to connect you to Christ, to know that relationship, to know that freedom, to know that saving grace that all can only come from God. And then to be a community, right? To live in this perfect harmony with each other, sharing these adventures and sharing this love that we have so, so much of. And then to be able to share that message with the world. And that's what we want to do. So if you're a guest with us this morning, we just love the fact that you're here. We're praying for you. We're, we're excited that we get to share this message with you. Take a moment, fill out our, our Connect card. Let us know how we can continue to pray and serve. If you're watching online, take a moment, click that button. Let us know how we can come alongside you. But as we uh, continue to worship this morning, let's remember where that salvation comes from. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Thank you, Rob. So, um, encourage you uh, to take a look at this video we're going to show. It's a Vacation Bible School recap, and we're really excited, grateful for all of you who served. Why don't you have a seat for just a moment, and, um, and you can see what, uh, what occurred this last week and um, what your efforts, uh, I think, accomplished.
Yeah. Surprisingly, it was not that quiet during uh, Vacation Bible School. Let's get, almost a moment of silence for the, for the that technology is great until it isn't. That's just the way it works. But we want to thank Shannon. Will you come um, join us up here? I believe, I believe that um, I, I just looking at the evidence of what she did and knowing how many hours she was here at the church. Um, I, I mean, it had to be a hundred or, or, or so hours. I've never seen anything like it. And I, we are so grateful. It was fun partnering with the Augusta uh, Chinese Christian uh, Fellowship. Um, uh, they've just recently purchased or in the process of purchasing a building and they were looking for a place to, uh, to perhaps use the facilities. And you know, these aren't ours, right? <laughs> Nothing we have is ours and certainly not this building. It's the Lord's. And so, uh, and then we found out that they were um, doing the same curriculum that we were doing. It was just like the Lord put it together. It was a blast working with um, working with them and uh, just seeing how it worked. Well, the theme was monumental, and it, it goes back to, there are a lot of cacti around here, and my girls will attest when they were picking this out that this is not artificial. This is real and injurious, so be careful. I'm going to hand that to you. It's got a gift inside. We want to thank you as a church for all the time that you did, uh, put in, and, and we never know what the, what the results will be and what eternity will show in the lives and hearts of these kids. Thank you for investing in our kids, Shannon. We're grateful. I invite you just to stand uh, as we together worship and exalt our Lord. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on the cursed tree bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh
guys go ahead and be seated. We have a, a new song that the youth and um, the youth and Pastor Kevin have been really excited about. Uh, we actually got to do this song at camp and probably have heard it. It's been been out for a while, but uh, we want to teach this song to you guys and um, it. Just worship however you feel led. If it's just to focus in on the words and allow those to just wash over you with truth. Um, it talks about magnifying the name of our Jesus um, in our daily lives and across this world. So um, if you want to just take a few minutes and do that, or if you know it, please sing along um, as we worship together. creation suddenly articulates with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be
Will you continue that, that prayer with me? Father, we ask that in our lives and especially in these moments, as we look into your word, that your word would look into us and that what you see would glorify you. And where it doesn't, God, where our lives need adjustment to your perfect holy word, we ask that you would give us grace by your Holy Spirit to obey your word and in these moments to act in obedience to what you've told us to do. We pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, eyes to see what you see. We pray, Lord, that our hearts would be an altar where constantly we're yielding ourselves in surrender to you. You alone are worthy of that glory and that honor and that blessing and power. So Christ be magnified not only in our lives, but even in these words, in your word we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Kids, you can head to Children's Church out the back at this time as you hear the word of God. We're praying for you and praying that God gives you ears to hear what he has to say to you. Well, welcome. Again, glad to see you and uh, coming off this great week of Vacation Bible School. Uh, it's it's uh, exciting to hear uh, what God has done in lives and look forward to seeing what God does in the future. I'm going to invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 Thessalonians. We are nearing the end. I think it was two or three weeks ago I said it's like a, a horse that as uh, the horse gets closer to the barn begins to gallop quicker. I don't know if I'm doing that or not, but uh, we're going to try to make it here to the end. And it's been just a great joy to be in this book. You might remember that this book was written to believers who were struggling. I don't know about you today, but uh, it seems more than ever, and perhaps it's just been the climate of culture or the circumstances in the last uh, two years, but it seems to me anyway, at least anecdotally, that people are struggling more now, at least in the, than they have in the last several decades. Uh, people seem to find, as Christians seem to be finding it harder and harder to live out their faith in a way that shows sustained victory and continued encouragement. These are hard days, and we know that's especially true for our brothers and sisters around the world. Things are not easy for them. And so if you've ever struggled, if you've ever had someone you love struggle, I think you'll find some comfort and some encouragement today. Perhaps you've had this experience before. You've got a, a task around the house or something that needs to be accomplished, and you think about what needs to happen, and you begin the project. Maybe you are doing a remodel around the house, or perhaps you're fixing something in the car, or maybe you've got uh, a project that requires a great deal of administrative skill, and you begin to tackle that. Perhaps you're trying to update your computer. And you, whatever it is, you, you enter the task, and you think, okay, I think it's going to take about this amount of time. You ever had those? We, Marianne notoriously, or says I'm notorious for underestimating the time by at least half. You know, that project's going to take about an hour or, or whatever. You know, what's eight hours in, you know. Uh, but maybe you've had that, and you kind of have this cycle in, in as you begin a, a pattern or a project or a job. You, you start that job, and you're like, we can do this. And then you start to hit opposition and obstacle and difficulty, and, and the thing you're fixing, actually, you break, you know, and you make it worse, so something else has to be fixed on the thing, and and it begins to, it seems like the problems begin to multiply and the, the struggle increases. And then you kind of get to a place where you're like, uh, I, I'm going to, I think I'm done. I'm going to give up. I'm going to call in a professional or we'll just leave this wall half hanging down and the, you know, the tile broken off. I don't even care anymore. We're just done. I feel like giving up. And then, you know, if you persist, you, you usually get through this place where, where that big uh, hump, that big mountain is has climbed and you go okay i think we can actually make it and finish it if you persist i wonder if paul having that same sort of picture in mind that there this christian life is a struggle it's difficult knows that as we persist god will show himself faithful he said elsewhere in um in philippians that he who began a good work in you would be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He wanted these believers, who most of them were less than a year in their faith, if we line things up according to the book of Acts, as we believe they, them to be, he knew that they were going to face mounting criticism from family for turning to Christ. 
They might receive economic sanctions from the community who doesn't want to sell to them because they don't worship the false gods that they are worshiping any longer. They might experience uh, an unusual amount of satanic opposition within their own spirit where, so that they are exhausted and discouraged. You know, it's funny that at various times in your life, not so funny, at various times in your life, you can face the exact same circumstances and situations, but your state of mind and your emotional well-being and where you're at even spiritually and how all those things intersect and intertwine can affect you might be experiencing the same things and going through the same things perhaps that you have in the past, but because of where you're at physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, it might seem absolutely overwhelming in that moment. But Paul is just is aware of all those things, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he knows that believers are going to struggle. They're going to have a hard time. They're going to have a, a difficult time determining whether they want to go uh, follow after Christ or revert back. Now, despite perhaps the, uh, the difficulty of trying to understand how someone reverts and where that means they are spiritually and understanding that there are those who leave and walk out on the faith and they never really knew, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They really never knew the Lord. It was a real situation that Paul wanted to avert, that they could hold on to their faith by the grace of God. And that leads to the question, what do we do when we see other people struggling? What do we do when, when believers in the body of Christ are having a hard time? How do we approach them? And that leads also to the question, you know, what, what do we hope other believers will do in our lives when those kinds of situations happen? Paul, in this remaining section, which we've entitled Final Instructions, is talking about how we approach other believers. So we're going to look at four instructions. We'll see how far we get today. Four instructions for struggling saints. These instructions are intended specifically for the whole body of believers. Paul addressed this in the second person plural, which means all of you, as this letter is being read to these believers, all of you are to do this for other believers. Um, but you can certainly apply these things to yourself as well. All right, we're going to look at these four. Let's get the passage of Scripture in front of us. It's a simple, short verse. It's 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 14, we've already looked at the previous verses. This comes on the heels of Paul reminding them and encouraging them that Christ is coming again. They didn't miss the second coming of Christ. So now reading in verse 14, he says this. And we urge you, brothers, and you can see these verbs, you can underline them. These are the main points. Here it is. Firstly, admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. And there is your outline for this morning. It's pretty clear. Paul makes a, a, a very um, clear staccato-like in music. It's a very rapid-fire succession of, of what we are to do. We looked at previously in, in the verses uh, before uh, how we're to relate to the leadership in the church, the pastor, elder, teacher in the body of believers. It's to, there's to be esteem and respect and there's to be peace among the body of believers, but he seems to be moving uh, even in greater circles, not just to address how leadership in the body of believers is to be treated, but how we're to treat all of uh, the body of Christ together. And we begin with this first instruction, and that is to admonish, admonish uh, the lazy or the idle or the unruly. We're going to look at that, what that word actually means there in just a moment. Admonish the idle. That word idle, keep a Put an asterisk, a little star by that if you're taking notes because there are a number of ways that could be translated which affect the meaning we're going to see in just a moment. But most of the translations move towards this idea of idleness. He uses the word um, parakleo when he uses the word urge or um, we beg of you, we're asking. He says, we're coming alongside of you. Now, Paul's done this about three or four times. He could, in his apostolic authority, say, this is what you've got to do. And we will say that each of these verbs mentioned here is mentioned in the imperative tense, which means, or imperative case, which means he's telling them, he's giving them a command saying, you've got to do this. But notice the nurturing love that he has as he does this. He, I'm appealing to you as brothers in, in Christ. We're family together. So uh, I could come with all of the strength and power and authority of the Holy Spirit as an apostle and say, you've got to do this. But I want to appeal to your hearts. Your brothers in Christ, your sisters in Christ, we're family. We're in this together. And as family, we should look out for one another 
in that regard. So when he's giving these instructions for how we relate to one another, for how we relate specifically to a struggling saint, he, he's coming from the background of family. We're in this together. So he says, I urge you, I exhort you, I'm calling you to this action, brothers, as family members, admonish the idol. That word admonish can range from the word instruct or to warn, uh, to exhort, even reprimand. There are times when believers, we have to correct each other. There, there are times when, uh, because we love someone another, uh, one another, because we love someone, we love them enough to say things that are true but hard. The Bible says in Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. No, no one likes to, well, that's not true. I've met a few that like to, but most of us don't like open confrontation. We're, we're not given or prone to that. We, we'd rather have peace, but there are times when there's no genuine peace because truth has been compromised and uh, holiness has been eroded in someone's life. And so the brother who loves, the sister who loves someone has got to go and speak truth to that person not because they don't love them but because precisely they do love them like when a when a child growing up uh is doing something that's going to be dangerous for them either in that moment or if that pattern continues that has to be corrected because uh, we know that a lifetime of that kind of behavior will not work it's going to be injurious to them in the same way paul saying there are times when brothers and sisters in our lives um, are, are living in such a way that, that they are going to cause themselves spiritual harm. And the loving thing to do is to admonish. That word admonish me, comes from two Greek words, which when smashed together, mean to put into the mind of someone. Sometimes we, sometimes the truth slips our minds. Sometimes we have spiritual amnesia. There are times in our lives when we forget the truth, at least it's not in the front of our minds. The reality is there are times when we are tempted to forget who we are in Christ. Believers, anytime we're tempted to sin and, or, or tempted to question who God is, question the validity and truthfulness of God's word, enter into a, a lifestyle apart from Christ, we forget who God has made us. Remember the scripture that says, um, he, he lists, lists off all the things you were, and it's the most heinous list of sins. And he says, but such you, uh, such, but you were such as these before, but you were washed and cleansed. Sometimes we forget who we are, and we as believers need someone to put these things back into our minds. That is, in part, the, the role of the, of the sermon and the role of the pastor teacher, to put into minds the truth of God's word, but not singularly, the role only of the pastor and teacher. All of us as believers are to help, correct, and instruct. And whom are they to instruct? It says here in our translation in the ESV, instruct the idol. Now that word is, can be translated in a host of ways. And the reason that's important to bring that out is because it affects the meaning here. So let me just break this down. The New English translation says admonish the undisciplined, uh, another translation says, warn the irresponsible, warn those who do not work. The New Living Translation says, warn the lazy. The NIV is like, I can't make a decision on this thing. Warn the idle and disruptive. <laughs> Just puts two words when there's really only one word in there uh, in the original language. The idea is, comes from the previous, the, the Hebrew prefix, which means opposite, and the word which means discipline. So in ancient Greek and Roman times, there are Troops were required to be incredibly orderly. They lined up in rank and in file. They lined up in column and in row. They, they lined up, and, they, and if they weren't, it would be deadly. They had these really cool precision uh, attack and defensive moves where if everyone were precisely in line, they could raise the shield up and the top would be completely covered from arrow fire. The sides, because those on the, on the flanks of, of, of those uh, troops would would hold out to the side. So on all sides, they could move forward and be almost entirely defended with these massive shields as they marched forward so that that together, as they worked orderly and in ranks, uh, the whole group could be protected. But, you know, as it is with human nature, there are oftentimes people that uh, that don't listen. <laughs> they walk out of rank. They, they, they either go AWOL or 
or they, they're just marching to the beat of their own drummer. And it brings danger not only to themselves, but danger to the whole group here. So those who went out of line, those who were out of rank or out of order, would the word here, atakos, would uh, describe those who were disorderly, those who were doing their own thing, unruly, is one translation puts it. Now, specifically, these undisciplined, unruly, not battle-ready kinds of people were those who were easy to be picked off and endangered the rest of the group. But Paul brings in all of that meaning here that says sometimes we've got to admonish and, and speak to those who are endangering themselves and those who are um, endangering the rest of the body of Christ. In fact, this problem seems to have persisted, and Paul uses the same word only in, in a different form in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let me read these, and you can see that why um, several translations translate this idol, uh, meaning we as believers are not to be the kind of people that just sit around that are lazy, that are undisciplined and unruly in our lives. He uses this word specifically with this issue in his second letter to the same group of believers. He says this, Now we command you, this is Second Thessalonians 3, 6 through 12, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received uh, from us. So Paul says, we've already told you. That was true in this first letter. And it was true in, from chapter 4 in his time that he had spent with them. Evidently, some in this context had believed that Christ was coming again so soon that they ought to just quit their jobs, maybe sing around, sit around, you know, campfire, sing kumbaya, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and not have any real world responsibility, not have to live and work and, and, and actually provide. And they were doing this. The problem is that, you know, after a while, the money runs out, right? <laughs> after a while, whatever it is that you sold or however it was that you provided, you, you don't have any resources. So now you're living off of someone else's generosity. Now these believers, and it seemed to be somewhat endemic, these believers were living off of the largesse or kindness or generosity of someone else who was working. And that would cause, you can imagine that the tension that would cause in the body of Christ, we have a familial obligation to one another. We've got a responsibility to take care of one another. But then there's this sense of, wait, are you not even doing your own part to take care of yourself and your family? And you can imagine the rivalry and the frustration and the conflict that that would cause. Like people just not do, I mean, it causes that in society. It certainly would cause that within the body of Christ. So Paul goes on to say, it says, don't have anything to do with people who refuse to work. We're not talking about pe those who are physically or mentally unable to provide for themselves. We're talking about those who are able to do something, but they're just too lazy. They'd rather let someone else do the work for them. And, and he says, because of this, he says, you know ourselves how we, you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone else's bread without paying for it. But with the toil and labor, we work day and night that we might not be a burden to you. It was not because... We don't have the right to, but, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would, not give you th we would give you this command. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? Not willing to work, don't eat. But it would probably solve a lot of problems. Think about it. How, how long would it take when, if, if, if for someone to go, hey, I'll do whatever it takes at this point because I'm, I'm hungry. For if we hear, we hear that some of you are walking in idleness, remember this is the second letter. So Paul addresses it in chapter 4 of the first letter, and it still hasn't been resolved by the time he writes a second letter, some months later. He says, we hear that some among you are walking in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Okay, so now another problem has happened. So they're not working, they're not putting in 8 or 10 hours a day or whatever, they're not providing value or product or service. They're not helping society. They're not helping their own families and working. But instead, they're taking that time to get into other people's business. I mean, they've got all the time in the world, evidently. And haven't you noticed that? That, that oftentimes those who are not serving and active and, and ministering are the ones who get into other people's business because they just, they just have time uh, to do that. Or it's easy to pick off someone else. Well, 
that's exactly what's happening here. Now, such persons, he says, we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. So here's the command. Here's the admonishment is that there are those who may not be living, working, serving in a way that's consistent with Scripture. They've, they've become lazy. They need to be corrected. I was watching a World War II um, documentary. I don't know why I get fixated on that era. It's just uh, it's fascinating to me, not because I, I like war by any means. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But they were uh, talking about the, the North African troops that came in from Australia. And the, the commentator said they generally had the reputation of being undisciplined, <laughs> unranked. When senior officers would come by, they wouldn't salute them. They didn't keep, they didn't even stand up in ranks, you know. And they just had this reputation of being disorderly and carousing. Well, I pray that we as believers never have that kind of reputation, but that we're diligent. This doesn't mean we overwork. Overwork is a mistrust in God's providence. There is a proper time to rest, believers. Let me just say this. I don't know that growing up I really heard this much. Um, I think that, that, uh, that industry and hard work was so drilled into me uh, in my younger years that I never really learned to rest. And there is a proper time. God rested as an example for us on the seventh day. There's a time to put things down and trust that I couldn't have enough hours in the day to make everything work properly. I've got to rest and stop and trust that God is going to do. But there's an opposite end of the spectrum we can go, and that is to say, all I do is rest, and all I do is trust and depend on someone else to do something for me, and I don't, I'm not active myself. So believers are encouraged, hey, we should be diligent people, not only for uh, providing for our family and for those in need. Paul said that, by the way. He says, make sure you work so that you may have something to give to those in need. But we should not only do that, we should also find ourselves um, diligent working for this, the kingdom of God. Here's the second uh, instruction we're to do with those who are struggling. So these believers were struggling with regard to what they should do uh, in their lives. But these other believers mentioned in the next phrase are those struggling internally. He says this, encourage, this is verse 14, encourage the faint-hearted. That word encourage is another command and it means to console or to soothe or to bring comfort. It's used in John 11 when Jesus goes out to meet Mary, and Mary goes out to meet uh, Jesus, and the ladies come out. She's grieving, and it says these ladies went out to comfort her, to soothe her. This is the role, believer, that we're to have in other Christians' lives, to bring comfort to them in their difficulty. The root word of the idea of comfort means to speak, to tell a story, and to converse with. It has affectionate intonation to the word. The idea is that we have stories to tell. We have conversations that we must have. We have encouragement for others to bring if we, uh, as we come and encourage them in difficult times and situations. This is a gentle, calm speaking to build someone up. Maybe you've struggled. Maybe you've lost someone that you love. Maybe you've had the great disappointment of uh, expecting something to happen only to have the pieces seem to fall out or the rug pulled out from underneath you. Maybe you had an idea of how you thought your life was going to go and uh, it just did not go as you scripted it. Perhaps you've had those times in your life where there is such pain and such difficulty you don't even know how to put it into words. And when you do go to share it with someone it doesn't seem like it, it, it's as big as it feels deep in here. He says these were faint-hearted. Some translations say of little or courage or those who were timid. Comes from a couple words which means little and soul. Suke, little of soul. There are times when it feels like our soul is shrinking. It's diminishing. It's dwindling. Times when you have shrunken and you've grown weary. Weary of doing well. Paul said in Galatians, do not grow weary in doing well, for in due season you will reap if you faint not, Galatians 6, 9. But there are times when if we're to tell the truth, we are weary and troubled of soul. We're we're shrinking. Our spirit is despondent. We are broken. And what are we to do when we find ourselves there? Well, obviously, 
we go to the Lord and go and spend time and let him nourish our soul through his word. But there are times when we have to be open and willing for others to come alongside and console and comfort us. Believers, let me just say this. I think especially in American Christianity, we tend to keep people at arm's length. We've been trained to be independent people who, as we've just been instructed, scripturally do our own thing, work, right? We're independent. But, but believers, we, we were never meant to be so independent that we didn't need one another. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that we are, the eye can't say to the ear or the ear to the eye or the hand to the, that, that we don't need one another. Instead, we, we, we do. And we need the comfort that comes from one another. Believers, I'm going to encourage us as a family of God to look out from our own difficulties. Doesn't mean we ignore them. Doesn't mean we don't seek encouragement from others. But to look out for our, from our own difficulties, to lift our own heads up from our own problems and look and see the needs of other brothers and sisters. They need you. They need a phone call. But by the way, you can still do that. I don't know. <laughs> no, everyone just texts now. That's fine, right? That's good. Sometimes that's just great. You can actually call someone, though. That's not a bad thing, right? Now you almost need to text someone to get permission. Can I call you? Is this a good time, right? It's just kind of the whole calling etiquette thing has changed. But I'm just saying you can pick up a phone call. You can, you can make something. You can send a card or a letter. I mean, you know how meaningful it is now actually to get a card or a letter from someone because no one does that anymore, right? How much more meaningful than that you took the time to do that? You can go to their house. I mean, you know, maybe a phone call or a text beforehand might be helpful, but I mean, whatever it takes, you can grab the brother or sister uh, after their service. You can invite them to lunch. You can bake them some chocolate chip cookies, not because that's I'm just saying that, I mean, like, if, I'm ever, if I ever look discouraged, chocolate chip cookies are the key. I'm just telling you that. I don't know that that's from the Lord. That's, that might be from me, maybe. But, but <laughs> saw, like, a little bit crispy on the outside and gooey. Okay, that was really for me. But, like, okay, so I'm just saying, like, think about people need encouragement. And not just encouragement from cookies, right? But, but a little more real. They need encouragement for their soul deep down. Someone to come alongside them and say, God will be faithful. You hold on. God has not abandoned you. Remember, remember, he said he would never leave us or forsake us. I know you know that, but remember the word. Remember the scriptures. I think we've, we've seen, you know, think we tend to be pendulum swingers, reactionary from one thing to another. We've seen people who speak biblical truth to other people, and they're bombastic, and they're loud, and they're harsh. They're uncaring, it seemingly, and unfeeling, and they're just like, well, you just need to whatever, you know. Like, well, you know, that's, that's a little strong. But so, so we pendulum swing over here, and we don't speak truth. Like, we don't want to be like that guy or like that person who's just always in someone's face telling them what to do, but it doesn't seem to be truth in love. So we're just over here like, I'm going to be in love, but I'm never going to speak truth. The combination of those two things are absolutely necessary for healing in the believer's life. We have to have truth in love, not one or the other. Speak truth. Listen, you feel like God's given up on you, but the Bible says he will be faithful to complete what he began in you until the day of Christ Jesus. Truth, but in love. We've got to continue to be those who do that. Encourage the faint-hearted. I wonder why these believers here in Thessalonica were so weary. Why their souls were shrinking when they just had been given life. Why, when, why did the newness and the excitement and the vibrancy of coming to faith in Christ diminished so quickly? What was it in the context that brought these believers so low so quickly that they needed to be reminded to be in each other's lives and to encourage? Perhaps it was the trials and tribulations in chapter 3 of this book. Verse 5, we're reminded that, that they were under persecution. Imagine your mother, your own mother, your own father, turning their back on you because you don't worship the family idols anymore. Can you imagine not being able to go into the business place and buy your necessities or having to buy them at a, oh, we got a special rate for you. It's just financially harder, right? No friends and family discount here. Can you imagine being ostracized everywhere you go, talked about, mistreated, aligned? We know soon after this, about 10 or 12 years after this, state persecution started to rise from the Roman government. But right now, there was persecution from one another, their own family group, their own, the people that they grew up with. 
So maybe it was this external persecution. Some of them had become fearful or discouraged. Paul, when he brought the gospel to these believers, had to end up leaving the city because there was such a riot that occurred. Every believer was one who was at any point given to persecution. Maybe the initial excitement of coming to faith in Christ had worn down because the reality of the Christian life is a daily dying to oneself and the grind, the hardness of having to deny the pleasures that you just gave into before. Like before you were a Christian, you just did whatever you wanted to do. I mean, maybe you heeded some consequences. Maybe you tabulated in your mind. Maybe you did an algorithm in, in, in thought, well, I'll give into these pleasures, but these pleasures have too many consequences. But you made that math, and you just kind of did ultimately what you wanted. But when you came to faith in Christ, you understood it was a matter of taking up your cross daily, denying yourself, following after him. And, and, it, and there's an appreciable toll that it takes of denying oneself. That's why we constantly need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So perhaps this we read these believers, and they were faint-hearted. Perhaps it was that a number of these believers had died. We knew that. We know that Paul addressed these Christians and said, "Look now, concerning those who have fallen asleep, I don't want you to be ignorant, right? Don't be, don't be. Maybe some of them were so d- distraught at the idea that these believers in Christ had died, and were going to miss out on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead, because or the resurrection uh, uh, when He came, comes back again, and they needed to be." filled in on the truth that there's hope for any believer. Whether they're living and dead, they're all going to be caught up together in his presence, and so will ever be with the Lord. Perhaps this is why they were discouraged. Or perhaps it was like it is with us, a combination of many different factors. Have you ever noticed that in your life, when one difficulty or trial comes your way, depending on the severity or intensity of it, and and longevity of it. But when one trial comes, you can typically handle that okay. I mean, it's like, okay, man, this is a really difficult time, but but let's get through this, right? But then the things begin to stack. You you ever had that happen in your life? It's not just one thing. It's, It's two or three or four or five things. Maybe you've experienced this financially. You're like, I can't believe the dishwasher went out, you know, kind of pay three, oh, 400 bucks for a dishwasher are you kidding me you know or whatever all right or you, or, or uh, then and then and then something happens with the car right the starter goes out or the transmission you know starts clunking and and then oh you are you serious i ran over a tire a, a, a nail too and my tire is flat you're like okay this is crazy and then then you get a phone call saying hey we need to come in and do some tests we need you to come in and do some tests on some things. And then guess what? <laughs> you had a leak around the house. And then someone's just really irritating at work. Right? Among all the other things, the irritation is not that big, but it's just like all of it together, right? Things begin to stack on your life and you become so heavy and so wearisome, you just want to quit. Perhaps it was like that with these believers. It was the, the persecution It was the denying oneself daily of things that they used to want and and be able to give themselves over. It was the the pressure from family. It was the the discouragement from having uh, having lost loved ones and not knowing what was happening with them. Perhaps it was the stacking of things that made them spiritually exhausted. Believer, I don't know about you, but when, when we come to those kinds of times, we need each other all the more. We need brothers and sisters to come alongside and encourage us. We, I, I don't know if you've had this experience before, but there is an appreciable and powerful effect when someone comes alongside and you know, you know they've got your back. And you know they're going to really be with you. And you know they really love you. And when they come and encourage you and speak truth to you and soothe and comfort you, it's, it's the real thing. And you know you can go to them. And you can really, not, I'm not just talking about unburden yourself with every little thing and then walk away and they walk away burdened and you feel great, right? Light, oh, that was great. I'm talking about a real relationship where it's reciprocal and, and you can share one another's burdens. Here's what Galatians 6, chapter 1 and verse 2 says. Brethren, if you see one another overtaken in any trespass, any sin, 
It says, restore such a one. That word means to mend a broken bone. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. That reminds us of the first command we gave there, admonish those who are idle or unruly, undisciplined. There's a time for restoring, and that happens and begins with admonishing. The next verse, though, goes, and bear, well, this is Galatians 6, 2, and bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Pause for just a moment. What exactly is the law of Christ? Well, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment or law, Jesus answered this way, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second commandment is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. What's the law of Jesus that we fulfill when we bear one another's burdens? It's the law of love. Brothers and sisters, I get it. I understand when you've, when you've lived a certain number of years, when you've ministered a certain, uh, when, when you've been serving one another, um, doesn't even have to be professional. It just means you're, you're in each other's life. I get it. Over time, you start thinking, you know, I, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of burdens. I don't know. And, and I think naturally, if we're not walking in the Spirit, we, we tend to want to not only keep others from seeing what's really going on in here, but we tend to want to keep others at a distance so that we don't have to deal with their stuff either. <laughs> is, is that true? Just, no? Just, just going to leave me hanging up here? Just me? Aren't we sometimes tempted to be selfish with our time and our energies and our emotions and not want to, not want to give out of ourselves? Because that's going to require energy, emotional, spiritual time and resources and brothers i want to just encourage you to console and to soothe and to comfort and to look what if all of us were active in encouraging one another what if, what if every one of us didn't sit around waiting for someone to come along and encourage us but actively looked at how we could encourage one another you know, sometimes when um, people are looking for marital advice, and I know this isn't a foolproof way of dealing with it that'll fix every problem, but it's not a bad place to start anyway. What if the husband and the wife made it their aim to out-love one another? I don't mean they have a chart <laughs> hidden away that they check boxes off. I don't mean that they, they keep long records of how they did and whether their wife or husband was deficient in that same area. I don't mean that. I just mean in every situation, you do your best to outdo one another. In fact, that's what Scripture says. Outdo or outperform one another in love. Isn't that a great... Like, if everyone had that mentality and mindset, if everyone were seeking to out-encourage one another with genuineness, we're not talking about faking or feigning something, right? But with genuineness, if, if we would find ourselves, I think, held up all the more as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the root of this is from that first word in this section, brothers. The root of this is that we're in this together. It's an appalling thing that one might consider themselves closer to a band of brothers they served in the military with or are in a social club with or are in some sort of society or other network with than with the body of believers. Or... As the old, uh, as the old uh, TV show Cheers, where they had some place where, uh, you know, everybody knew your name, right? And they were always glad you came. Bum, 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 you can do the song. But, like, I, now it's going to be in your mind. It's going to be an earworm for the rest of the day. You, you can thank me. But shouldn't that be the body of Christ, where we are together encouraging each other all the more as we see the day approaching? Brothers, may we be an encouraging people not those who strip other people of their value and worth, strip their perception that the image of Christ is in them, but those who clothe one another. And the best place to begin, of course, is within your own family, within those who are close to you, to encourage. Do you see someone who's weary and faint-hearted, whose soul seems to be shrinking up in your family? Is there someone you can encourage there? Is there someone who needs admonishing and and perhaps they are scripturally out of line. And with truth and in love, you go to them 
and speak to them and encourage them to, to line back up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, those who are struggling need attention. And I would just urge us to be wide-eyed and vigilant and looking how we might support those in that way. I invite you just to bow your heads for a moment. Perhaps you thought to yourself, you know, the reality is, Pastor, I, I'm so struggling in, with my own situation. I don't, I don't even know if I have it within me to look out to someone else. I'm so weary. I, I want to pray for you in just a moment if that describes you. Uh, listen, we've, we've been there. You're not alone. Can I just tell you? You're not alone. Many of us have been there. Some of us are still there. And you're, you're just discouraged. You go, I don't know that I have any energy to, to, to be looking to encourage someone else. I don't know that I have, I, I mean, my well is dry, and I don't know that I have, I have any water to give. Listen, the spirit of the living God can use you even in your brokenness and in your emptiness to minister to others and as you are a recipient of his grace. And he can fill up just as quickly and faster than you're pouring out. Would you just give yourself to the Lord in these moments and just say, Lord, I'm struggling. I'm wrestling. Maybe that describes you. Perhaps, believer, you, you go, hey, I'm that, I am right there, and I need some prayer. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'm struggling. Just being honest this morning, I'm struggling, and I would like someone to pray for me. Would you just raise your hand? I'm not going to embarrass you at all. Right on, right on. Anyone else? Okay, good. I'm not going to embarrass you or ask you to do anything. I, I just, just knowing, I, I want to pray for you um, in just a moment. And then may, maybe, believer, you'd have to say, yeah, I've had my eyes on my own stuff, my own difficulties, my own troubles, and I've not really been looking. I mean, I've been so consumed with what's going on in my own life, I've not really been looking. And I just need, I just need Christ's eyes um, to look and see so that I might encourage. If that's you, raise your hand, would you, all over this place, right on. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to join myself in your category and just pray for us. And then at, during this song, you just call out to the Lord, will you, in your own prayer, calling out to the Lord for his grace in these moments. Father, thank you for your word. It is true and living, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces deep into our hearts, and it reveals things about us. And I thank you that you are unwilling to leave us as we are, but that you desire to draw us closer and closer to Christ. So I pray... I pray for those who may be uh, in a place where they are scripturally and spiritually out of line, unruly, or maybe even resulting in laziness. I ask that you would give them grace to align themselves to your word. Help them to see. I pray that we might be willing to go and be in people's lives in such a way and have the kind of credibility to speak truth and love to others. And then, Lord, I pray for those who are faint-hearted. They're, they're just shrinking. I pray that you would grow them up nurture them, water them, hydrate them in the truth of your word. And I pray that we might actively look for whom we might encourage. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me at this time? We're going to sing this song about how good God is and um, that he would even know us and call us by name. Uh, let's just rejoice in the truth of the gospel. God loves you so much. He sent his only son. The reason we have encouragement is we know that this life is not all that there is, and that Christ is here with us. He's indwelling and living in anyone who would believe in him. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave make a way for us to know God and be restored to the, the king of all kings, Jesus Christ. And so because of that, we can have life and life forever. And if you want to talk about that and your relationship with the Lord uh, after the service is over, we'd be honored to speak to you. Let's sing about his grace and his mercy. Who am I that the highest king would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, always 
truth this morning. A um, couple announcements for you guys. This week, the youth are leaving to go to Carowinds on Tuesday. Um, I'll be sending out all the official details. Uh, they'll leave. We usually meet at 8 a.m., but I will send out the details via email and um, Facebook page and things like that so that people have all of those. Um, and that, so be, please be praying for us for safe travels there and back on Tuesday. We will not have um, Wednesday night youth. This is in place of our last Wednesday for this, for this month. Um, other than that, we have our Bible study that will be meeting on Wednesday night here at the church at 630. Um, if you want more information about that Bible study and what it looks like, um, Dennis wrote at the back, um, we'll, by the offering box back there, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about that. Um, any other updates, please just make sure to look at our, our emails that we send out weekly um, on our in social medias. And if you happen to uh, see Shannon at the end of the service, maybe just thank her so much again for, for all the VBS uh, prep and everything, because that really did go well. And uh, we may try to send out that little video so you guys can hear the amazing theme song, because by the end of the week, I was singing that song literally every day on my way home. I was just like, I was just singing Monumental Love, and I kept singing it, and I'm prob I'm pr probably got really annoying. I'm sorry, guys, who had to be around me. Um, but it was, it was a really great week. Um, any other announcements that I am forgetting, Rev Kev? Okay, awesome. So please be in, be in prayer for one another. And um, Pastor Kevin's going to send us out with um, a blessing. Yeah. Uh, Lord willing, this coming Sunday, we'll finish this about struggling saints. And then the following week, we're going to do, we're going to talk about soul care. So that's two weeks from today. Um, what if you're the one struggling? <laughs> maybe you're like, okay, this is what we're supposed to do for others, but maybe, maybe what if, and it's really, I tell you what, it's just some great commands and reminders for us um, that Paul gave to the church and are going to be good for us. So just kind of cueing you up a little bit there. But we sing about in my father's house uh, and being in his presence, and I just want to read a blessing for you and uh, remind you of the future that Christ has purchased for you from Revelation chapter 7. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, Lord, even so, come quickly, Jesus. We long for the day when we are reunited with you, and we long for the time when we will be in your uninterrupted and undiluted presence. Now, for grace and strength for this week, we ask for these believers. Bless them in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.